Spawnery is the premier podcast spotlighting people of color. Every week, we talk news, what we've been playing, and tell you who's invited to the cookout. Our show is all about talking about gaming through a prism of blackness, because we are the culture. Welcome to Bukaka, y'all. Yo! What's good, everybody? This is the Spawn of Me podcast with Khalif Adams. I'm your host, Khalif Adams. I hope you're doing fantastically well. I hope you're having a wonderful part of your week. It is now Thursday. We have gotten over the hump, and now we are almost at the weekend. It is the start of summer. Can you believe that already? It is moving that fast. The planet continues to spin uh, faster than we can actually track it at this point. But, you know, that's the way it goes. It's the way it winds up happening uh, on this planet that we call Earth. Earth. I am very excited to be here because we have a fantastic show. But before we get to our amazing guest, I have to say thank you to everyone who has been checking out our Summer Games Fest content. We put up 11 episodes, 11 mini episodes on the feed, both in audio and video, so that you can check all that stuff out. Please go check that out, specifically on Spotify, because Spotify is where you can see all of our video episodes that haven't made it to YouTube yet, because I'm lazy. That's the reason why, is because I haven't actually put them on our feed yet but it is really cool to be able to see all the reception that we've been getting on on spotify so before we we jump into everything i got to give you a couple things you got to check out one you got to give some love to our our, our hosts and, and our friends over at nzxt for being our hardware sponsors they are powering Bricago in all the ways that you see here second of all if you want to leave us a message there's a really dope link within episodes that you can go send me a message that message will then go into upcoming episodes i want to get i want to get back to doing ask ka anything so that is all up to you, and, and, and you are the ones who are going to be driving that. So please make sure you do that. There's also a lot of fun polls and questions that I will drop into specific episodes, episodes so you can check out all of that goodness here. Me, I'm doing pretty well. I had a, had a really interesting week. It's been, again, doubling down, tripling down on the job hunt. It has been just a busy, busy week in terms of all of that. Had a really good, fun time talking to my friends over at Field Day here locally in Portland about the work they're doing and had a really great conversation with them about diversity, inclusion, all of that wonderful goodness there uh, in that mix. Uh, we have a guest in the chat currently who says, Vicious six nine six. Never heard of this cat. He says, "I want to ask if Ka. I want to ask Ka if he can cook." You gotta, you gotta put that in the in the link. That I just, um, I'll answer it there. I'll, I'll give you a really full, robust answer. You know, I got the cookbook behind me from from the fam Andy Lunique and all that good stuff. So if you can, if you're watching the show on Twitch.tv slash Spawn on Me, you get a chance to see all of this goodness live. But today is about. A returning champion to the show, returning champion to Bricago, someone who I've looked up to for a while. He's done fantastic work in this space for a very long time and also has the best mini fro in the game. I got to bring you up with Jordan Miner. Jordan Miner is rocking from PC Mag, senior apps and games writer. Here he is. He's rocking with us today. Welcome, 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 Jordan to Bricago. Welcome back to Bricago. It's so good to see you. How you doing, fam? Uh, it's good to be back. I was I was remembering. I think it's been seven years was the last time I was on here. Yes, uh, that E three show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a nice recording in the middle of the JW lobby, <laughs> hanging out and talking. Many things have happened since. Uh, you know, you you you've gotten promoted. I believe at PC Max this is on the we saw you there uh, till now. You know, you've been, you got hitched. You got married. All yeah, these wonderful things, them, yeah. all these things. Time is flying, fam. All of that to say, how are you doing? How's everything going? Good. Um, very exciting times here for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> even <laughs> even just since the pandemic started, a lot's happened, and that was like half of the time we were just talking about. Oh my god. Um, yeah, but it's good. Everything. A lot of stuff that was kind of started a while ago is now sure. really paying off so yeah of course i think i think again i think you're one of the smartest writers in the space i i, I really Thanks. have come to enjoy your work and perspective with with the, the pieces that you put out and the angles that you talk about games you talk about the the tech space in those ways how how has everything been going at pc mac because i know we, i definitely want to get into the book because that's the, ma the main reason we're here tonight but the work that you do at pc mac i think for the folks at home who may not be might be fully aware of all of your work talk a little bit about what you cover on that beat and, and some of the work that you've done so far 
Sure. Uh, so apps and games ends up kind of encompassing pretty much anything sort of software, like entertainment wise. Yeah. So I, I review a lot of games, uh, obviously, but I also cover like Netflix and other streaming services, um, stuff like that. Um, I review dating apps, which is really funny now that I'm married. Um, I reviewed meal kits for a, for a bit when those were really popular. Kind of at the beginning of the beginning pandemic, people were all really curious about like HelloFresh and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so I covered stuff like that. Um, but you know, games are still what I mostly care about. What I mostly try to write about when I can. Yeah, I mean, and and you know, happy that that is still a, a part of the mix for you, but. I'm really excited to talk to you about your new book, Video Game of the Year, that that, that you wrote. I, I am this oh this book right here. This book r- magically look at that. It's like the cooking shows where you just have a full meal just ready for people to get as soon as you talk about yeah. the finished product. I am yeah, so excited. This will take like two years. We're taking it out of the oven right now. <laughs> it is a long time cooking. It's been cooking for a minute. So. First of all, congratulations, because it, it is a it is a monumental thing to be able to put out a book. And this is a banger of of a publication. I think, you know, getting a chance to, to kind of scrub through some of it earlier today and see the angle that you're talking about this kind of monumental time period. Give the folks at home, you know, a little synopsis of, of what this game is. And, and then I want to talk to you about why did you decide to make this? Because it's pretty fantastic. Sure. So it's video game of the year. And the whole structure is every chapter is about what I think is the most important game of that year, Um, whether it's because it's the most important game or like the best game or the weirdest game or the game that sort of kind of uh, represented like the most important trends. And Mm -hmm. so each chapter is about one game and each chapter is one year and it goes from 1977 to 2022. It's it's wild because for, you know, reading the the kind of like uh, prologue, if you're going to use video games and movie terminology for it, you talking mm-hmm. about your kind of initial connection to games kind of starting in 97 mm-hmm. and, and then rolling through now your career as a games writer and a person who is, you know, now have having authored a book about video games. You know, when you go through the process of the concept for what this is, what was the thing that sparked it for you to say, this is a road that I want to go down and, 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 and amass all of these amazing contributors to this project? Yeah, so I wanted to write something that was comprehensive, mm-hmm. but still like uh, digestible, I guess. Like there are some really good, really thorough game history books out there that are almost kind of overwhelming because they, they just they just throw so much at you and there, there's so much kind of history to take so i want to do something with with this you can it's you know you can it's episodic so you can kind of skip around if you want like each chapter is very standalone but then if you read the whole thing then it does kind of paint this larger picture um so i wanted to do that i also wanted to do a, a game book that really focused on games again compared to these other kind of game history books out here that are very good and very well reported um a lot of them are about kind of behind the scenes stuff or kind of, I think maybe focus a little bit too much on like executives, like, yeah. <laughs> like games aren't, games aren't, games aren't just cool because an executive thought of a good marketing plan. Like games are also <laughs> cool art. <laughs> They're also like art objects. Right. Um, so I wanted to do sort of like a mainstream, like a games criticism, but for the mainstream. So, oh. you know, the chapters are kind of like big reviews in a sense. Yeah, I I like the fact that, you know, the way you've kind of gone about the angle for this does not only talk about the kind of significance of what that game was to, you know, the the people who, you know, contributed to those particular games and the kind of uh, amalgam of all of that in that space. But I love how you also have like contextualized some of the, the these releases in the year that they came through with some flavor of you know, what was happening in the gaming industry around it that kind of gives that nice kind of, you know, um, structure to the book and also gives the, 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 the reader, if they're, if they don't remember, cause you know, time is flying. Like if we, right. there's so many things yeah. that have happened yeah. in the gaming space around the time that certain games came out when you were going through and doing the research for this and kind of pulling all that information together, 
did you see any kind of early trends that happened in certain parts of the ecosystem? So like the seventies, when I was when 78, when I was born and you know, you're go going back to 77, that's still like the early parts of the video game industry. Were there parts of that that you like, oh, this is a really interesting block of time that did something very special within the game space? Uh, yeah. So for 1979, I picked this game called Speed Freak, which yeah. is a really early uh, vector graphics game yeah. uh, and a ra early, early racing game. And that was fascinating to me because when we think about uh, games that, are, that tend to be sort of like graphical showpieces, I think racing games are a big genre for that. Like mm -hmm. a lot of consoles launch for the racing game to show off. Here's what we can do. Here's how like fast and shiny, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a car in and of itself. So the idea that even going back to like the very beginnings of the genre, that a racing game was being used to show off you know, vector graphics tech that I'm sure was very like mind blowing at the time that, oh, like all along, these two things have been sort of joined like this. Um, and we see that now with, you know, into Forza and then stuff like that. So that, yeah. that was, and that was, yeah, that was a, that was an interesting one for sure. Yeah. It, it was, it was cool to kind of dig through and see again, like stuff that I knew that were kind of, you know, on my bucket lists of games that were like, oh, well, this one very much aligned to a very specific time for me. Like, I, again, like 97 was the year that Final Fantasy dropped in a real way and like landed for the masses in a way that resonated and fully like push that push that IP into a new space. When you went through some of these and was like, I, all right, this is the one for this year. Were there any ones that were surprises for you that, that when you went back to kind of go through the analog, I mean, through the, through the annals of, of that, of that research that you were like, oh, we have to weigh this in a really interesting way to kind of like pick the one that's going to make the book. How did that work for you in, in that, in that respect? Uh, well, yeah, that's why I kind of cheat sometimes or be like, oh, well now I'm using like. <laughs> um, you know, like uh, I picked Tetris for '84, but like no one was no one was playing Tetris in '84, right? Like, except for like some Soviet, like some article wrote about it and said no one was playing that game in '84. <laughs> Soviet scientists. Um, so I just cheated to get the games I wanted to, where I wanted to get them a, a lot of time. Uh, that's why I also kind of had this like um, what do we end up? I, I, in early drafts they were called B sides. Yeah. In the final book they're called they're called extra lives. In the yes. Book, um, where there's like a runner up. In each chapter too, so I could kind of double dip if I wanted to. If something was, I really couldn't let something go, or <laughs> some choice was just too impossible. <laughs> um, but yeah, the mantra was: it's my book, it's all my picks. You know, no one's yeah. gonna sue me. <laughs> We're like, excuse me, Mister, excuse me, Mister Minor. Uh, we have to have a conversation about 1997. Uh, or 99. Uh, yeah, uh, Zelda came out in 86, actually, but it came out, you know, whatever. It came out in America in 87, so that's the 87 chapter. Uh, I, I love that. And I do like the extra lives uh, layer of the book. I think that that also kind of rounds out, you know, the kind of, you know, feeling of what those years were. Because I, I, I also think about that, too, of like, as a person who's been in the gaming space and playing for so long, besides forgetting the context for where things drop, you also forget just like how many games were out in a specific year and how that impacted the industry mm -hmm. and all of those things. Totally. What were some, you know, happy surprises in, in not just talking about what got picked, but like what were some new tidbits of information that you wind up learning about some specific games that you have in your, in your mind? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would have to say, yeah, just the way that some of games are sort of like, like kind of in, like being almost in conversation with each other. Yeah. Um, like in 2009, it is, it's, it's Uncharted 2 is the, is the main pick and then Batman Arkham Asylum. Um, and it's interesting that, our, you know, Uncharted is a game that I think is trying to be really cinematic in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and you know it's it's gameplay is kind of it's gameplay but then batman is interesting is that it's taking something that we that we that we know from comic books and from movies and then trying to gamify those ideas so it's kind of coming from the other direction mm. um so stuff like that was was interesting to me um or like in 1980 like a game like rogue um again a game that at the time no one was playing it but like kind of like students and stuff yeah. but now that's one of the most like influential games like ever um just all, all these games that are like rogue yeah it it does wind up kind of also bringing to light and i thought this was something that was good when i was going through it was 
it did have this very um interesting lens not not only just what was picked but the the conversations that kind of laid out around those specific games and it did feel like you know i think gaming is also a a, a creature of habit and winds up having these these genres and these eras of games that either feel very similar or feel like they have you know pulled and 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 were inspired by other things that were in that mix to be able to kind of you know bring that game to the forefront did you see any anything that when you went back and you were like oh this was a game that maybe i didn't hadn't played that then when you went back you were like oh i can see the connective tissue between this and this other game that wound up coming out i mean you talked about rogue but were there any other examples of that that you kind of saw that you could recall um i think one of my more controversial picks is spore for 2008 um ah, yeah and the uh the the it's i guess not this connection to a specific game but more so that spore ended up being the sort of harbinger of games with just impossible hype like just <laughs> expectations yeah. that just no game could ever possibly meet um you know people were so excited for that game and then it was promising things that were just like you know it's not gonna be the forever game that can do everything um it's gonna just be you know uh, a game that exists eventually um and now i think you can draw a connection between that kind of um hype bubble bursting to like, I mean, you don't see this much anymore, but like to like Kickstarter games that end yeah. up having to promise a lot and then, and then don't or games that kind of launch kind of undercooked, but then maybe over time get closer to what they were saying at the very beginning. Mm. Um, so that, that was an example of a game that I think is important because of um, being an example of a trend more so than even being a great game. Yeah. It's funny too, because now thinking about it in that sense, like Spore was the the be all end all game. That game was supposed to be the thing that Mm -hmm. was going to usher a new era of gaming in the way that game design and game development was going to change. Because that was almost like the beginnings of the, the, the DLC market in some weird ways, at least, right? Like, I, I liked the fact that when you picked it through these games and, 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 you know, made your roster for the years, that we were able to see not only the one hit wonders, but the, the ones that kind of came through and resonated in some bigger ways like that. Uh, when, when you reached out to, to folks to contribute to this, what were some of the things that they shared that, that you were like, oh, I hadn't thought about this in this way? But now this is giving me some new interesting context for a game that I either knew of or didn't know of or was a favorite and maybe turned maybe changed your mind or was it was there anything that when the because you had a fairly like wild robust amount of folks who helped to kind of contribute at least thoughts to, to, to this yeah. book. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that because I thought I thought that was brilliant and, and you know for for clarity and for and for 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 all of that. I am also a contributor on on this book as well in terms of sharing some thoughts about some games that I loved as well. Um, But I'd love to hear your thoughts about like when you started to reach out to folks and what was the kind of premise and and impetus for that too? Well, yeah, I mean, so, okay. So just about the the motivation for reaching out to people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yeah. So that was always part of the plan. Um, I wanted this book to have as many games in it as I, I, I could fit in it, as many different perspectives on games yeah. as I could fit. Um, I didn't want to pretend like what I was offering was anything objective or the final word on anything. Um, I think to talk to, to offer any sort of definitive take on games would have to involve a whole plurality of people because gamers are a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of different opinions. Um, so I wanted to get other takes in there to get other to get games I haven't played or I haven't heard of even um, just to, to to make it richer overall um and to be able to highlight more people too yeah um, I, so I, that was a big motivation there no it was and right. a podcast to talk about it no it was, i mean it was super dope i, I mean I, I was like when you're doing promo for it it's always nice to see like you know you sharing the folks that that, that helped to kind of lend a voice to it in that way what was if you were to think about it and we don't want to spoil any 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 goodness of the book in a, in a major way but if you had to think back about a spicy take that was in there that was besides Spore, what would have been one of your kind of spicier uh, additions to to the roster in this then that that you that you want to highlight? Um, I'll highlight this one because actually people can read this chapter on Vulture right now. Oh, nice. Um, my chap the 2019 chapter on Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. 
huh. um, ends up being a lot about why I don't like Souls games. I've never liked those games. Huh. Um, I find them just to be obnoxious. I think, <laughs> think that their difficulty I is it. interesting I at all. It. They waste my time. Um, <laughs> I've never liked them, and I've tried to. I've tried to play them. I went to an event for Sekiro, and I left halfway through because I'm like, I don't like this. Um, I'm reclaiming my time here. Um, <laughs> But those games are undeniably very beloved and very important games. So they deserve a spot for sure. And I picked Sekiro because that was the one I had the most experience with at the time. But two, you know, that came out 10 years after the Demon, after Demon Souls really kind of got it going. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it proved that, you know, it's a lasting thing. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's also especially hard because it's not an RPG. So you can't really cheese it the way that you can in maybe like Elden Ring or something. Um, so that's a pretty controversial one because I don't like that game at all. But I will say that um, another reason why I want to have um, guests is to potentially provide counterpoints to mm. something. You know, I'm not saying that my take is correct; it's just my take. But that take that chapter has uh, blurbs by Tamor Hussein mm. and Scott Benson about uh, Bloodborne and Demon Souls, and those are two of the best written uh blurbs in the whole book they're so like they're really beautiful arguments as to why those games are cool and why the difficulty is like character building and you know, i don't agree with that at all but like it's a really it's a, it's a really persuasive argument it's a really persuasive argument by two like fantastic writers that i i love and i'm really honored that they just try to contribute to the book this is the reason why i love you so much is because it's <laughs> like yo it's a fantastic <laughs> angle to what that is. I have no agreement with that thing at all, but it's only, but I appreciate the hell out of that. Cause I think we all have those versions yeah. of takes, right? Like, the, like I've, it's, I'm final fantasy. Like people like call me a final fantasy hater. And I'm like, well, I don't understand why people like that game, but it is beloved by millions of people in ways that I cannot understand at all. Uh, so, so, so I get that layer of, of that piece of conversation in that way. I would love to have seen a, or I would, I'm hoping, first of all, I'm hoping that this sells 2 billion copies and everyone, and then you go on Oprah and then Oprah's like, here's Jordan and all the goodness. And then you just become a rich man and you leave, you leave us all in the gaming industry to be able to do whatever you want. Fantastic. I would love that. I also, I also would love to have seen a version of this that is debate team style. That we that goes on some platform. You kind of just roll through the years and just like, here's my two picks, and then you have like a team on other people. Like, here's my two picks. Here's my stuff. How how do you how do you kind of like balance out not kind of digging into the favorites, right? Because it's a that's a hard thing to do. Like, I think every video game award show, you know, every video game kind of debate conversation, there is the the zeitgeist pick that a lot of people like to dig into what was the ways that you kind of got around that too because i think that's always hard like people have an expectation for what they think you should pick and to be able to subvert that and say well look these are the reasons why these games resonated in these ways and these are the reasons why they made the book for this year what was what were the ways that you kind of talked about this with your editors and and, and stuff like that like really have a, a full kind of breadth and depth of of, of all of that kind of time that you had to deal with? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the whole list was decided before they even bought it. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of one of the very first things we established was the whole list. Um, yeah, so kind of looking at it on a more macro view, you know, um, I wanted it to be, again, a really comprehensive video game history, like in totality. Uh, so to achieve that, it was very important for me to make sure as much as many different things were represented as possible, whether that's like all types of genres, um, as many of the major publishers as I could, um, trying not to hit the same thing, the same franchise too many times, um, even though that, some of that did happen. Um, so, you know, having one of my kind of guiding ideas be like, not just not just it being the best game, but like the, the a, a collection of games that together represent um, as much as, as a, what games can be, uh, as, as I think possible. Um, so, you know, like the last chapter is the Stanley Parable, uh, Ultra Deluxe, um, mm. which I think is a really, a really, you know, uh, people may not think that that, uh, that uh, enhanced port of that game from last year was the most important game of last year. Um, but I think that game is representative of a lot of really cool things um, as just not as an indie game, but a game as a game about games, uh, as a game that's doing really fascinating narrative stuff. 
Um, the ways that that remake or that, you know, it's, it's a remake and a sequel and a kind of revisitation. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of like challenging your notions as to even what a sequel is. Um, and just what, the, what choice is in gaming. Um, so just that as one example, um, super meat boy is a chapter oh, and yeah. that whole chapter is all about, um, like flash gaming um in parallel with indie gaming as a really important kind of um underrepresented kind of force i think um tom fulp the creator of newgrounds is in the book and i think mm-hmm. you know that that's that is almost like a school of game design in and of itself i think is really underappreciated um so so just stuff like that so that, that that would end up leaving some games that you might think would be in here getting cut yeah um you know there's only like <laughs> but I think it was worth it to have more, you know, more diversity. You, you could call it. No, I love the fact that Newgrounds got a nod in in the space because I think it's like if you are of a certain age, you grew up mm-hmm. with the internet in its infancy. Like I didn't have the internet when I was growing up, and flash games were a huge instrumental part of the way I thought about video games as being, you know in a weird way the first versions of games of service because you were like you have to go to this thing to go here to go get this game to go play this thing that's going to be on this platform that may die tomorrow or you don't have access to it (laughs) because someone on the in the house picked up the phone you were in the middle of playing the game and it killed your modem to be able to do that stuff I love that you added stuff like that in, 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 in the mix of all of these games because I think we also have this really interesting space in the video game industry where we try to strip games from being games because of the way that they were formatted or the platform that they were on or some of the really early stuff that was in there. When you look back at the <clears throat> kind of full capacity of, of the book, what what was the biggest surprise for you coming coming out of this project? Because I think you know you spent you said oh, what two years writing this, or more than that, I'm sure. <laughs> you know what were some of the things that what were the, the kind of major surprises if there were any for you personally as a person who has been doing this work for a long time has been you know embedded in these spaces for a long time, and has a, a very learned perspective on this. Were there any big surprises for you after you made the book? I think the biggest surprise for me as someone who writes about games um, is that the, the normal games journalist sort of uh, kind of day-to-day thing is writing about new games, games that aren't out yet, or games that have just come out. Um, I mean, today I was out playing a game that's not out yet. Yeah. Um, that's sort of what you're doing in your normal day-to-day, and that is kind of impacting how you can write about a game because you're writing about it in the moment. Um, so what was really surprising to me about doing this, um, I said that the chapters are kind of like big reviews in a sense, mm. um, but it really was cool how much perspective you can gain like when you when you review a game with this much hindsight how much that can really change what you would even want to say about it you know mm. um like i in the fortnite chapter i talked about how i saw fortnite as like an unreal when back when fortnite was just like an unreal engine demo mm-hmm. um and i'm like okay like sure i saw <laughs> a video of that okay but, but then it's like you could you know I, you can't even imagine what fortnite would become and what i would end up having to say about it um you know all these years later um, that ended up making, I think that, that made some of the, the, the later chapters, I think some of the, actually the harder chapters to write because mm. there's less hindsight and there's less room to see what they've done. Um, so, it, you know, you'd have to take a game like Animal Crossing that is so tied now to the pandemic. Yeah. Um, or a game like, um, you know, Pokemon Go, which is at this point like eight years old too, but that was another really kind of like instant phenomenon. So wild too. God, you said Pokemon Go was like almost eight years ago. What the hell is <laughs> happening to time? Like what? Yeah, what seven it does, years ago. Seven years ago. But it also, you know, I think I think the the reason I love this piece in this book so much is that it does. I think for younger folks who are kind of engrossed with the gaming culture currently, and I I say this as an old fart, is like one of the things that I harp on when I'm on my soapbox telling people to get off my lawn is like we don't understand how good players have it now because there is such a dearth of stuff that you can, you know, you can engage with when in those early seventies, eighties and nineties, you really were the generation of, I will play this one game until the cartridge falls apart uh, or the disc burns itself out. 
do you find that now, or I guess when you're thinking about potentially what the kind of second version of this book would wind up being, which which I'm hoping that this yeah, fingers be, crossed, yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, because I think the the premise yeah. of this book, which makes it so dope, is that you can continue to kind of like chronicle where we all are moving forward into this into this space. So it's like really brilliant and and, and fascinating at, at the way this kind of works. Do you think that? You, the thoughtfulness that has gone into this and that will continue into the rest of your work that the industry's ability to kind of understand what it's sharing with each other and sharing out to an audience does that change a little bit as well with the time that we kind of see coming because i think like right now it doesn't feel like the industry can take a moment to pause and reflect about what it's making as much as it probably needs to. Do you feel like getting a chance to like write this book and, and dig through that layer and have that, that perspective and go back and see the hindsight layers of it that we're going to get to a space where we'll be able to kind of do that in, in a, in a better way, or are we just going to just continue to like charge ahead and, and not look back and kind of give that space its reverence that it deserves? Um, well, what I hope, is that um, you talk about kind of pausing and looking what they what they're doing at the moment? I also hope that they pause and like consider the things that they've already made. Mm. Um, I think that like it's something that I, I really thought about in, in this as if you want if someone had never played any of these games and they wanted to like legally that would be so difficult. Yeah. Um, like just the whole games preservation crisis is something that I think is is a really uh, that companies do not value their own history um, and, and care to get it out to people um, as again, just as art that should be kind of appreciated. Um, you know, we the Nintendo Direct was the other day and I'm just excited to play like old games on there that I haven't <laughs> played in a long time or I've never gotten to play, you know? Um, yeah. So I hope that's, that's, I hope that people, they look at this, you know, because video games feel so young, they're really cutting edge. They feel like new tech all the time. But at mm. this point, you know, this book covers like 45 years of history um, it's older than me by like decades. Yeah. Um, uh, so I hope that I just hope that the companies get better about putting their games out there in ways that people can play them that kind of in perpetuity on as many devices as they can get it out there instead of just thinking, Oh, if we just hold on to it, then we can sell it back to them later <laughs> at like full price, <sighs> you know, like some of it, like it belongs in muse- it belongs in museum. Some of this stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so I know. That's, that's kind of my big takeaway. I mean, I, I know just having tried to purchase old systems that I grew up with was mm-hmm. extremely expensive and you don't know if you're going to get anything that's working. You, like, it's so hard to do that work. And it's really interesting, too, because I think from, you know, the time that we've both been in this space, there's also been that layer of that conversation for multiple platforms over the years. Xbox mm-hmm. was really big on 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 backwards compat for a little for a while and that seems to, to still be there but not a thing that they tout anymore. PlayStation is kind of just an effort and just like you, if you can find it you can find it. Nintendo yeah, of all PS3 the, just, PS3 doesn't even exist. Yeah. Right? Like you can't even play yeah. half that stuff without having the actual hardware. And Nintendo for as much as I I harp on the, the fact that they do make you buy the stuff all over again for the 10th time they do care about their old ips in a lot of different ways and i think they don't get actual credit for in that respect so it is it is cool to see you know you talk about the game game preservation layer of all of that too um because that is such an important part of of all of this is there is there a game that you are now itching to play that you revealed in the book that you didn't get a chance to, to, to mess around with when it kind of first came out? Oh, to kind of revisit it? Yeah. Um, I mean, basically everything in the book is something I played. Um, so I kind of had a take on it in that sense. Mm. Um, I will say that not a game that's in the book. But a game that I wish was in the book that is kind of mentioned. Yeah. Um, I, I, t- I talk about Forza Horizon as sort of like kind of the best of all worlds when it comes to driving games. You know, it's somewhat realistic, but it's got the open world stuff. Um, it has real cars, but it's not like a, a crazy simulation or anything. Yeah. Um, and that game, you know, those, those, those games are very good. But I really love Burnout Paradise. That's oh, my favorite racing game. Oh, man. Um, and I mentioned so that in good. there as like, yeah, it's, it's Horizon's good, but man, Burnout Paradise. 
Um, so I, I, I just get cravings to play that game all the time. Constantly. Yeah. You know, that, that Lego racing game just came out. I'm like, this is pretty good, but it's you know, Burnout Paradise, you know, so. God, I mean, if you get me into the racing game conversation, there's like two that I can think of right off the top of my head. Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit, because that was like mm-hmm. my jam for a long time. And Auto Modelista, which the game was. Oh, okay. I love just saying that name. Oh, that game was so good. Like, you know, I ha- and I think that's also a great part of, of of the book is that there's some deep cuts in there that I think a lot of folks might not necessarily know. You know, I I I'm sure that that the folks kind of wanted to dig into their their bag and be like, yo, here's a joint that nobody knows or might not know. Well, is that did that go into your motivation? I want to ask Absolutely. you, kind of what, went into, what was in your brain when you did your pick? Absolutely. So my pick was Pixel Junk's uh, 4 a.m. Uh, which was on the PlayStation 3. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was in my mind immediately. It was like, I want to be able to share a game that I loved, but didn't get that game got no love because it was technologically a little bit ahead of its time. It was a game that used the move controllers. It didn't really have an interface in the ways that you think of most games in terms of having a UI. And it was very much a singular experience or a, a solitary experience for you but you could enjoy it with other people, but you'd never see them, which was a, a part of the equation for my mind of like, I like things that push the envelope technologically, but also have a layer of connectivity to, to players in a way that you don't normally see. So like, you know, I loved when Gyro Might came out when, you know, when the NES was out and you had to get the Bob nice, robot yeah. to be able to play with it and stuff. Like, I like the fact that companies went real wild with, with some of those things in that mix. So that was totally in my mind when, when, I, when I shared that one for, for my personal pick. Did you see any more or that, any of that in the, in the mix? I was going to say, that's going to be so cool because that's going to be in the Rock Band chapter, which is one of the most mainstream games in the book. People are going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember Plastic Instruments. And then they're going to be like, what is this? Yeah. And like, that's video games. Yeah. Um, that's the whole breadth of it. Um, uh, your question about another kind of one like that, another kind of cool cut. That yeah. Did you, did, you, did you see anybody else who, who had like a really cool cut that you were like, oh, that game. Oh, yeah, that totally. One. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I could, you know, the main chapters kind of by necessity end up being a lot of really famous mainstream games, just kind of that's how it was. But um, yeah, the contributor blurbs ended up being a really cool way to get games that otherwise would have not gotten any love at all. Like um, uh, Eric, Chris Franklin, who does um, Eric Signal. I don't know if you if you've watched him on mm-hmm. YouTube. Um, uh, he's a great YouTube essayist. He did um, his blurb is on this uh, early Jurassic Park game that like all of a sudden shifts into like a really primitive first person shooter. And it's like how that was like a really mind blowing experience in like 1993 or something. Um, so that's in the halo chapter, which is I'm sure for other, other people, a really mind blowing FPS, uh, 2001 when that came out. Yeah. Um, that that one's a great one. I just don't want to spoil some of them. Yeah, we got to leave it for we got to leave it for for, yeah. it for, for, for yeah. the actual folks at home uh, who are listening to to, to cop yeah. the book. If I mean, watch uh, Austin Austin Walker's in this book, and his is a, is a total is, is is amazing what he wrote about the game he picked. So I, li- I liked his pick a lot. I mean, Austin is just brilliant, and he he has a really good yeah. he has a really good understanding of of not only what he likes but how all of that kind of connects to the greater industry in in that bigger way. So we don't we definitely don't want to spoil spoil that for the folks at home. If you're watching the show here on twitch.tv slash me, the link to the book is in the chat. So make sure you are checking that out for sure. This will be in the show notes for the episode as well. So if you definitely go cop the book, go snag it. Tell the folks, uh, you know, again, name of the book, you know, again, a little bit of the premise and, 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 and give them the pitch. Sure. So the book is View Game of the Year is a year by year guide. I'm just going to read the cover. Yeah. A year by year guide to the best. <laughs> boldest and most bizarre video games from every year since 1997 it's full of these essays for me and all these other contributors uh something else for people watching i guess i can show off is also just this incredible artwork oh, in yes. every chapter. um from a, a new york-based cartoonist his name is ren mcdonald this mm-hmm. is from the vice city chapter even if you can't read i think this book is worth it because these illustrations are so phenomenal yep they are um, very, very good. The, the illustrations, so I was like, every, ooh, I wish I could cop some of these. I want to buy some of these. They're so good. They're so yeah. good. Yeah, it does add a very, like, I love the, the visual flair that you've added to this. I think I think it's been 
extremely cool to, to to have that be a part of the look at that it's so good it is so fantastic like i want all of that on posters i can have in the crib uh it winds up yeah, being really knocked it out of the park. yeah it knocked it out of the park i think i think it definitely did add a, a very specific and, and cool layer to the overall product of, of this book and the kind of it really did connect the pieces in a, in a really fun way so i uh, thank you thank you for that thank them for that for for adding that to the piece it's very very good before i let you go um i did want to talk a little bit about some news of the day because it has been because time is flying like the, the episode is already almost halfway done but i did want to ask you about some of the news of the day if you have been under a rock and, and not heard any news about the microsoft ftc uh kerfuffle that is happening currently what I wanted to ask you is less about the minutia of it, because I think the minutia is an interesting thing if you really want to dig into your courtroom drama business of it. I think as a person who writes about games and is thinking about games, especially in this book and the way that you write for, for PC Mag and other places, you get a chance to contextualize all of the, all the things you play for players all around the, the world and the planet. Uh, are you keeping up with, on this at all in a real way? Like, are you watching some of this stuff? What are your What are some of your takeaways so far from from all of this wild business that people are, are talking about? Well, for starters, I had to write in the book a sentence that would still make sense depending on which way I end up shaking out. Uh, that was a fun <laughs> challenge. Um, it ended up being something like Microsoft moved to acquire them. Whether or not they succeeded, we you know we don't know. But that's yeah. they definitely did that. That will always be true. They definitely always tried. Yes. Um, you know I'm a big left wing guy. Yep. Um, at the end of the day, uh, so I'm not really about huge corporate mergers. Um, kind of on principle. Um, that's kind of been the you know uh, that's kind of been kind of the, the the biggest thing for me throughout this whole thing. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of trouble with Activision. A lot of things do need to change over there. I'm not saying that Microsoft is not equipped to deal with them. You know, they very well could if it does go through. You know, there's there's upside there. Um, but you know, I, I'm also just kind of a as like as, like, as a sicko, pretty uh, <laughs> intrigued by some a deal this huge blowing up in all of their faces. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, it's the, it's the whole big corporate merger thing. Even if it had nothing to do with video games. I think that that part of it would be something I kind of took issue with kind of, yeah. again, as, as someone really wary of, of big corporations, uh, yeah. across the board. I rock with um, that. No, I rock with that. Um, uh, but yeah, I didn't see really too much today. Um, you know, I was out playing another game today. I know, but I knew, I saw, I saw people like, are taking the stand. People are like giving statements, I think. Yeah. I, the, the, the current, you know, for folks at home who, who may not be up on all of this, the current layer of this is that the FTC has blocked Microsoft from kind of continuing to move forward. And now they're in the discovery period of finding out more information about, you know, all of the, the minutia of the conversations that have happened in between that time when the, the initial, uh, potential merger was to, was to start. So they brought a whole bunch of Xbox uh, executives to testify about their their knowledge, their doings, their connectivity to all of that stuff. And there's been some, I, I guess, news uh, that has popped off from, from those conversations about, you know, what did Sony know? What was Microsoft's planning towards most of this stuff? I think for me, when I was having my old man moment earlier on Twitter today, <laughs> my my takeaway was was less about the kind of corporate merger part because I feel like I'm with you. Like it, it, seeing all of these kind of groups get 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 bigger and consolidating in those ways don't really do anything for for the business layer of it. Besides, make more rich people more rich. But I always am trying to figure out the angle for players is to say like, well, how does this affect you? in the grand scheme if this goes down right it's like because i think that's been a, a layer of the coverage that i've seen that is still kind of murky like i still don't think people who if you're talking to them at home and you're like hey this thing is might happen and your xbox is going to explode like that's not going to happen <laughs> but it'll happen that something will wind up changing in the way that you potentially might get a game that you wanted or not get a game that you wanted before um, and that's kind of the, the latest layer of that conversation. I'm, I'm hoping that 
the folks who are, who are covering this stuff will dig a little bit deeper into those parts because there's a lot of speculation about the how things are happening but what does that mean for for folks who are going to try to spend their money on any of these games in the future with us being in a space that is, is fairly big uh in terms of the gaming industry making billions of dollars every year so that part of it it's is- very cool to see games at a courtroom like reporting that's just a cool thing to see right uh, as, as a writer yeah, yeah. I think the last time that happened at all wasn't there were no games writers having that conversation that I can think of, but it was like way back in Mortal Kombat days when that was kind of up up in up in Congress and thinking about that stuff. Um, Last question for you about uh, the book and because I just thought about it was I think we're probably in one of the better two year stretches for games in this space. Where do you think if you were to, to 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 posit? what either this year's or next year's entry might be what what do you think that might even be at this point because there are so many things that are in the mix yeah. right now what, what would what would that you know pontificate on what that potentially you think might be it's tough because it's great stuff but it's great stuff from areas that are already pretty well covered in the book yeah um so there's already a resident evil 4 chapter there's already a Res- there's already a Street Fighter Two chapter. Yep. Um, there's already there's several Zelda chapters. Um, uh, you know, Diablo is mentioned um, mm. earlier in the book. Um, you know, um, stuff I haven't had a chance to play yet. You know, I haven't had a chance to play Final Fantasy Sixteen. Yeah. Um, I I mean I am not the biggest Sony person in the world, but I do really like those Spider Man games a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was other consideration. I ended up kind of leaning more towards Batman, kind of in that area. Um, but I like those Spider-Man games a lot. I'm pretty excited for Starfield. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, Skyrim is in the book already as a kind of a big Skyrim. And then it's a contributed Fallout 3. So there's kind of that kind of Bethesda representation in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's another potential really big one. Um, I mean, I don't think, I mean, my personal favorite game this year is going to be Zelda. I don't really see anything topping that. Yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, whether or not I can just be like, and that's the pick, you know, <laughs> I, I could very well be, I could be that petty because, and I can be that petty because 2017, the chapter is Fortnite because it had to be, um, right? It had to be Fortnite 2017, yeah. uh, which is when Breath of the Wild came. So there's no Breath of the Wild chapter. So it could be some overdue justice there. Ooh. Um, but I don't know. It'd be hard. And that's why I'm glad, you know, again, these later chapters were the hardest ones. P- people ask, um, is there a 2021 chapter? And there is, but that chapter is all contributor blurbs. I did not write a 2021 chapter. Right. Yep. And then 2022 is Stanley, you know, 2022 is about a re-release of an older game. So that's yeah. another kind of cheat. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to pick for these new ones. Cause again, some of them would be really great, but it's hard to tell, hard, hard to predict in the future if this, that that was the one to ultimately go with. Yeah. But so it's a great year. I agree. It's a really great year. Yeah, it's it's wild, and I think it just continues to get get better. And you know, twenty twenty three is going to bleed into twenty twenty four, and we'll see what where that lands. So that winds up being, you know, if you're at home and you and you're, you're listening to all of that, and you're really a Breath of the Wild fan, you definitely start up the campaign for reparations for Breath of the Wild. <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, buying the book is reparations. <laughs> Uh, a lot. There's a lot of black people in this book, dude. It's I'm true. very happy with how that turned out. There's it's a lot true. of black people in this book. It is true. I, I mean, look, I, I, I am, again, I, I, I love your work. I think you have a brilliant eye for for all of this. I think you really take the time to, 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 to look at this from a really nuanced and smart lens. And you know, me, kind of skimming through the the initial copy that I have, and I'm gonna go cop a paperback version of it. It really has taken me down memory lane in one of the best ways. And I think for me as a person who has seen most of this kind of transpire in my actual lifetime, it is cool to see the context that you frame all of these in and kind of give the player and play the reader uh, and the player um, more information about the things they might have missed or the things that they might be able to go back and potentially play and check out. So um Thank you, fam. It's it's always good to have you on. Uh, I, w- I would love to have you back to talk more about this, especially when you go to, to Oprah's uh, Avocado Orchard and you're rich. Right. And you come back and, and, and you drop a little ladder for me and be like, hey, come along. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I've got ideas for other books, and if, uh, there's one idea in particular that if it, if it happens, I'm absolutely coming on the show to talk about it. Please, um, please, it. please, so, please. Uh, I would I, love and that. Thank, thank you again for thank you again for for contributing to it. You know, I I call this the best book about video games, and the reason I, I say that I don't feel like a complete egomaniac because <laughs> it's not just good because of my writing. It's good because of the whole collection of writing of people who 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 have uh, who have chosen to be a part of this. Um, so so thank you for for being a part of that. It was it was when when you sent the email to me, I was honored in the the biggest way. Anything anytime I can be connected to any work that you do, it is a it is a pleasure and an honor to 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 be uh, connected to you in that way. Everybody at home, Jordan Miner author of this amazing book video game of the year go cop it we'll have links in the show notes we'll have all the links in the chat for you to be able to check out it'll be up on the youtube version of our show in our episode today we're gonna let jordan go. july 11th july 11th july 11th july 11th july 11th cop that joint it get out. it get it tattooed on your chest and then have it on your body if you live in new york if you live in New York, uh, there's going to be an event at Astoria Bookshop. There are very few tickets left. Ooh, they yeah. might be gone by the time this is up. So. Oh, yeah. Yes. Go check that out. Let me know. Take pictures and all that good stuff if you get a chance to go and, and, and hang out with the fan. Dope. You got some fans in the chat as well. So that's awesome, too. Thank you, Jordan, for rocking with me. I appreciate you, fam. I'll see you very, very soon. We I'll have more too. Spawn on Me coming up in a little bit. We'll be right back after this. Hey everybody, Khalif here from the Spawn of Me podcast. Hey, we have been in the market for new PCs for a long time. And for our 10th year anniversary, the wonderful folks from NZXT have partnered with us in a collab to be our hardware sponsors. So if you are looking for a new PC to stream or to game in the best way possible, go check out nzxt.co slash Spawn of Me BLD and you'll be able to find a perfect PC for you, whether that be the player one machine, player two machine or player three machine the ones that we're rocking for our new studio build they have everything you possibly could need for the best pc experience on the planet remember to go check out nzxt.co slash spawn on me bld and it will get you set up right much love and peace welcome back to the spawn on me podcast i'm your host Khalif adams if you missed the first part of our show we had a banger fantastic interview with jordan minor talking about his new book video game of the year and it was brilliant i love the ability to go back and think about all the goodness that we've had a chance to play over our years and over the time that we've been game players and all of that into that mix and i think this book is a fantastic almost 300 page book of history spanning over 40 plus years of the video game industry it is really really brilliant and jordan is fantastic i just love being bringing him onto the show to talk about all of the goodness that he is making in the world um we have a couple of things before we get up out of here for this episode again please go check out all the content that is on our spotify uh page uh, it is really nice to be doing some work over there and making that um happen for for all of our friends of Bracago. please we are thinking about i am thinking about some new content i want to do a new show that is more about the work of connecting with all of you more again i want to continue to do an ask ka anything show i want to do more of that work i want to figure out good ways to bring you all into the show in a much bigger way so please 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 if you have anything that you want to dig into for our show please 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 bring that into the mix because it is really Awesome. I'm going to see if I can find that link and share that with all of you here in the Twitch chat. But we have a lot of good stuff coming. Uh, the MK1 um, online stress test is about to drop tomorrow. We're recording this on Thursday, the 22nd. It's going to drop on 20, the 23rd. I got a chance to check the game out already at Summer Games Fest and, and put up some footage. Uh, or we'll be putting up some footage from the stress test on our um YouTube page uh, and some of our social uh, social channels on our TikTok and all that good stuff on our Instagram. Uh, and I'm playing the hell out of Diablo 4. I am a level 64 barbarian. I am beating things up left and right. It is a pretty damn good game. If you want to join and rock with me and play some Diablo, there is a Bracago Cypher 
clan that is on Diablo 4. Look it up. I'll add you. We can get some games in and play that. There's also a Street Fighter 5, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Street Fighter 6 club that is there. That is the Bracago Fam Club. I forgot what we called it, but it's there. There's a Bracago one. You look up Bracago, you'll find it. Add that. We can get some games in there as well. Um, I would like to play some more stuff with y'all, get some more games in and play some fun things. Going to be checking out, uh, hopefully when it drops and when it comes in, Pixel Ripped, which is the PlayStation PSVR 2 uh, game that is, uh, you know, pulling in some nostalgia there. So we'll be talking about that. NZXT has sent over their new uh, speaker and headset and other goodness that's in the mix. So I'll be doing a review of that very, very soon. They are a hardware sponsor. So please go check the link out on all of our show pages there and give them some love about all of that as well. And there are a couple other games that I'm playing right now that I can't talk about that will be coming out very, very soon. We'll be doing reviews of those as well. So please. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Thank you so much for rocking today. Thank you so much for being a part of our family here in Bercago. Please, please, please. We have some uh, contact information on our website, spawnonme.com. I do really want to hear more from, from all of you if we can. If there's any feedback about the show, anything you want me to know, anything you think that I should be checking out, anything that you want to kind of dig into. And again, I'll try to find that link and put that. It'll be in the show notes for um, the episodes on uh, on the Spotify episodes. They will be there. Um, because it winds up going into each of the links of each new episode for the show. So please make sure you're checking that stuff out. Make sure you're going in and, and hanging out and doing all that work and, and, and sending over some really good information there. Let's see if I can find us a quick dopes link for that. And then I'll share it for all of you here watching the show on twitch.tv slash spawn on me. You get a chance to check that out all the time here on twitch.tv and get it all in so please make sure you're doing that hanging out with us and we'll all see you next week with more goodness from us here on spawn on me so please make sure you go check that out give us some love send us a review all that good stuff and then we'll see you very very soon much love peace y'all have a good night have a good time and wash your hands and wash your butt Make sure you all take care of yourselves and all the goodness around you. Much love and peace. (laughs) 